Chapter 7, Basic Nursing Skills. Learning Objective 1, Explain Admission, Transfer, and Discharge of a Resident. Moving always requires an adjustment, but as a person ages, it can be even harder. This is especially true if illness, disability, and mobility problems are present. Nursing assistants play an important role in helping residents make a successful transition to long-term care facilities. By giving emotional support such as listening and being kind, compassionate, and helpful, NAs can help residents feel better about their new homes. Residence Rights Box 7-1, New LGBTQ Residents. Entering a long-term care facility can be especially difficult for residents who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer, LGBTQ. These residents may fear that they will not be accepted by staff or other residents. They may worry that their partner will not receive the same welcome the spouse or partner of a heterosexual resident would receive. NAs must not judge residents. Every resident deserves professional, caring service from facility staff. The facility is the resident's home. All staff members should make every effort to make all residents feel comfortable and welcome. Admission is often the first time an NA meets a new resident. This is a time of first impressions. The NA should try to make sure the resident has a positive impression of him and his facility. Because change is difficult, staff must communicate with new residents. NAs can explain what to expect during this process. They can answer any questions that are within their scope of practice. If residents or their families have questions that an NA cannot answer, he should find a nurse. It is a good idea for the NA to ask a new resident questions to find out their personal preferences and routines. NAs can also ask residents' families about personal preferences if residents are not able to respond. Guidelines, admission. Prepare the room before the resident arrives. This helps her to feel expected and welcome. Make sure the bed is made and the room is tidy. Restock supplies that are low. Make sure there's an admission kit available if used. Admission kits often contain personal care items, such as a bath basin, an emesis basin, a water pitcher and drinking glass, toothpaste, soap, a comb, lotion, and tissues. The kit may also contain a urine specimen cup, label, and transport bag. Figure 7-1, Caption. An admission kit is usually placed in a resident's room before he or she is admitted. It may contain personal care items that the resident will need. When a new resident arrives at the facility, note the time and her condition. Is she using a wheelchair, on a stretcher, or walking? Who is with her? Observe the new resident for level of consciousness and signs of confusion. Look for signs of nervousness. Note any tubes she has, such as IVs or catheters. Introduce yourself. State your position. Smile and be friendly. Always call the person by her formal name until she tells you what she wants to be called. Never rush the process or the new resident. She should not feel like she is an inconvenience. Make sure that the new resident feels welcome and wanted. Explain day-to-day -day life in the facility. Offer to take the resident and her family on a tour. Show the resident important areas. When showing the resident where the dining room is, review the posted dining schedules. During the tour, introduce the resident to other residents and staff members you see. Introduce the roommate if there is one. Handle personal items with care and respect. A resident has a legal right to have her personal items treated carefully. When setting up the room, place personal items where the resident wants them. Figure 7-2, caption. Handle personal items carefully and set up the room as the resident prefers. Admission is a stressful time. Observe the resident as there could be something important that was missed. Report to the nurse if you notice any of the following. Disconnected tubing. Resident seems confused, combative, and or unaware of surroundings. Resident is having difficulty breathing, pain, or any other signs of distress. Resident has bruises or wounds. Resident has missed a meal during the admission process. Resident has valuables, medications, hearing aids, eyeglasses, or dentures. Follow facility policy on any other tasks that are required during admission. New residents may have good days followed by difficult days. Let residents adapt to their new homes at their own pace. However, report signs of confusion or depression to the nurse. Residence Rights Box 7-2, Admission. OBRA requires that on admission, residents must be told of their legal rights. They must be provided with a written copy of these rights. This includes rights about their funds and the right to file a complaint with the state survey agency. Residents must also be provided with information about their rights related to advanced directives. Procedure, admitting a resident. Equipment needed. May include admission paperwork, checklist and inventory form, gloves, vital signs equipment. One, identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. Two, wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. Three, explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. 
Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. Four, provide for residents' privacy with curtain, screen, or door. If the family is present, ask them to step outside until the admission process is over. Show them where they can wait. Let them know approximately how long the process will take. Maintains residents' right to privacy and dignity. Figure 7-3, caption. All residents have a legal right to privacy, and providing privacy is part of doing your job professionally. Your professional, respectful behavior can help put a new resident at ease. 5. If part of facility procedure, do these things. Measure the resident's height and weight. Measure the resident's baseline vital signs. Baseline signs are initial values that can then be compared to future measurements. Obtain a urine specimen if required. Complete the paperwork. Take an inventory of all the personal items. Help the resident put personal items away. Label personal items according to facility policy. Provide fresh water. Six, show the resident the room and bathroom. Explain how to work the bed controls and the call light. Show the resident the telephone, lights, and television controls. Promotes resident safety. Seven, introduce the resident to his roommate if there is one. Introduce other residents and staff. Makes resident feel more comfortable. Eight, make sure a resident is comfortable. Remove privacy measures. Bring the family back inside if they were outside. Nine, place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 10. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 11. Document procedure using facility guidelines. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. Residents may be transferred to a different area of the facility. In cases of acute illness, they may be transferred to a hospital. Change is difficult. This is especially true when a person has an illness or her condition gets worse. Staff should make the transfer as smooth as possible for the resident. A resident should be informed of the transfer as soon as possible so that she can begin to adjust to the idea. The nurse will tell the resident about the transfer and should explain how, where, when, and why the transfer will occur. Any questions the resident has should be answered. NAs help residents pack their personal items before transferring. Residents often worry about losing their belongings. NAs can involve them in the packing process. For example, the NA can let the resident see the empty closet, drawer, etc. Procedure. Transferring a resident. Equipment needed may include a wheelchair, cart for belongings, the medical record, all of the resident's personal care items, and packed personal items. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Collect items to be moved onto the cart. Take them to the new location. If the resident is going into the hospital, they may be placed in temporary storage. 5. Help the resident into the wheelchair or onto a stretcher if one is used. Take him or her to proper area. 6. Introduce new residents and staff. Makes residents feel more comfortable. 7. Help the resident to put personal items away. 8. Make sure that the resident is comfortable. 9. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 10. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 11. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 12. Document procedure using facility guidelines. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. To discharge a resident from a facility, a doctor must give the discharge order. The nurse then completes instructions for the resident to follow after discharge. The nurse will review these instructions and information with the resident and her family and friends. Some of these areas may be discussed. Future doctor or physical, speech, and occupational therapy appointments. Home care, skilled nursing care. Medications. Ambulation instructions. Medical equipment needed. Medical transportation. Any restrictions on activities. Special exercises to keep resident functioning at the highest level. Special nutrition or dietary requirements. Community resources. NAs help by collecting the resident's belongings and packing them carefully. The NA should know what the resident's condition is at the time of discharge and find out if the resident will be using a wheelchair or stretcher. The day of discharge is often a happy day for residents who are going home. However, some residents may feel uncertainty or fear about leaving the facility. They may be concerned that their health will suffer. NAs can help by being positive. They can remind residents that their doctors believe they are ready to leave. However, if a resident has specific questions about care, the NA should inform the nurse. 
Residents Rights Box 7-3, Transfers or Discharges. OBRA requires that residents have the right to receive advance notice before being transferred or discharged from a facility. The written notice must contain the specifics of where and why they are being transferred or discharged. It must be in a language residents can understand. Staff must provide proper preparation for the transfer or discharge. Procedure. Discharging a resident. Equipment needed. May include a wheelchair, cart for belongings, discharge paperwork including the inventory list from admission, residence care items, vital signs equipment. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promote understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Measure the resident's vital signs. 6. Compare the checklist to the items there. If all items are there, ask the resident to sign. 7. Put the personal items to be taken onto the cart and take them to the pickup area. 8. Help the resident dress and then into the wheelchair or onto the stretcher if used. 9. Help the resident to say his goodbyes to the staff and residents. 10. Take resident to the pickup area. Help him into the vehicle. You are responsible for the resident until he is safely in the vehicle and the door is closed. 11. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 12. Document procedure using facility guidelines. Include the following. The vital signs at discharge. Time of discharge. Method of transport. Who was with the resident. What items the resident took with her. Inventory checklist. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. Learning objective 2. Explain the importance of monitoring vital signs. Nursing assistants monitor, document, and report residents' vital signs. Vital signs are important. They show how well the vital organs of the body, such as the heart and lungs, are working. They consist of the following. Measuring body temperature. Counting the pulse rate. Counting the rate of respirations. Measuring blood pressure. Observing and reporting the level of pain. Watching for changes in vital signs is very important. Changes can indicate a resident's condition is worsening. An NA should always notify the nurse if the resident has a fever. Temperature is above average for the resident or outside the normal range. The resident has a respiratory or pulse rate that is too rapid or too slow. The resident's blood pressure changes. The resident's pain is worse or is not relieved by pain management. Orange box 7-1. Ranges for adult vital signs. Temperature. Mouth. Oral. 97.6 to 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit. 36.5 to 37.5 degrees Celsius. Rectum. Rectal. 98.6 to 100.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 to 38.1 degrees Celsius. Armpit, axilla, 96.6 to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. Ear, tympanic, 96.6 to 99.7 degrees Fahrenheit, 35.8 to 37.6 degrees Celsius. Temporal artery, forehead, 97.2 to 100.1 degrees Fahrenheit, 36.2 to 37.8 degrees Celsius. Normal pulse rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Normal respiratory rate is 12 to 20 respirations per minute. Blood pressure. Normal systolic pressure is less than 120 millimeters of mercury. Normal diastolic pressure is less than 80 millimeters of mercury. Low blood pressure is less than 90 over 60 millimeters of mercury. High blood pressure is systolic pressure of 130 millimeters of mercury or higher or a diastolic pressure of 80 millimeters of mercury or higher. Temperature. Body temperature is normally very close to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius. Body temperature is a balance between the heat created by the body and the heat lost to the environment. Many factors affect body temperature, such as age, illness, stress, environment, exercise, and the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is the 24-hour day-night cycle. Average temperature readings change throughout the day people tend to have lower temperatures in the morning. Increases in body temperature may indicate an infection or disease. There are different sites for measuring body temperature. The mouth, oral. The rectum, rectal. The armpit, axilla. The ear, tympanic. And the temporal artery, the artery just under the skin of the forehead. The different sites require different thermometers. Common types of thermometers are as follows. Digital, electronic, tympanic, 
Temporal artery. Mercury free. Figure 7-4. Caption. A digital thermometer. Figure 7-5. Caption. An electronic thermometer. Photo courtesy of Welch Allen. www.welchallen.com. 800-535-6663. Figure 7-6. Caption. A tympanic thermometer. Figure 7-7. Caption. A temporal artery thermometer. Photo courtesy of Exergen Corporation. www.exergen.com. 800-422-3006. Figure 7-8. Caption. A mercury-free oral thermometer and a mercury-free rectal thermometer. Oral thermometers are usually green or blue. Rectal thermometers are usually red. Photos courtesy of RG Medical Diagnostics of Wixom, Michigan, rgmd.com. Numbers on the thermometer allow the temperature to be read after it registers. Most thermometers show the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Each long line represents one degree. Each short line represents two-tenths of a degree. Some thermometers show the temperature in degrees Celsius. The long lines represent one degree. The short lines represent one-tenth of a degree. Small arrows or highlighted numbers show the normal temperature, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and 37 degrees Celsius. Figure 7-9, caption. This shows a normal temperature reading, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and 37 degrees Celsius. There is a range of normal temperatures. Some people's temperatures normally run low. Others in good health will run slightly higher. Normal temperature readings also vary by the method used to take the temperature. A rectal temperature is generally considered to be the most accurate. However, measuring a rectal temperature on an uncooperative person, such as a resident with dementia, can be dangerous. An axillary temperature is considered the least accurate. An NA should not measure an oral temperature on a person who is unconscious, has recently had facial or oral surgery, is younger than five years old, is confused or disoriented, is heavily sedated, is likely to have a seizure, is coughing, is using oxygen, has facial paralysis, has a nasogastric tube, a feeding tube that is inserted through the nose and goes into the stomach, has sores, redness, swelling, or pain in the mouth, has an injury to the face or neck. Procedure, measuring and recording an oral temperature. Equipment needed, clean, digital, electronic, or mercury-free thermometer, gloves, disposable sheath, cover for thermometer, tissues, pen, and paper. Do not take an oral temperature if the resident has smoked, eaten or drunk fluids, chewed gum, or exercised in the last 10 to 20 minutes. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Put on gloves. 6. Digital thermometer. Put on the disposable sheath. Turn on the thermometer and wait until the ready sign appears. Electronic thermometer. Remove the probe from the base unit. Put on the probe cover. Mercury-free thermometer. Hold the thermometer by the stem. Before inserting it in the resident's mouth, shake thermometer down to below the lowest number, at least below 96 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. To shake the thermometer down, hold it at the end opposite the bulb with the thumb and two fingers. With a snapping motion of the wrist, shake the thermometer. Stand away from furniture and walls while doing so. Holding the stem end prevents contamination of the bulb end. The thermometer reading must be below the resident's actual temperature. Figure 7-10. Caption. Shake thermometer down to below the lowest number before inserting it into a resident's mouth. 7. Digital thermometer. Insert the end of the thermometer into the resident's mouth, under the tongue, and to one side. The thermometer measures heat from blood vessels under the tongue. Electronic thermometer. Insert the end of the thermometer into the resident's mouth, under the tongue, and to one side. Mercury-free thermometer. Put on disposable sheath if available. Insert bulb end of the thermometer into the resident's mouth, under the tongue, and to one side. 8. For all thermometers, tell the resident to hold the thermometer in her mouth and with her lips closed. Assist as necessary. The resident should breathe through her nose. Ask the resident not to bite down or talk. The lips hold the thermometer in position. If it is broken, injury to the mouth may occur. More time may be required if resident opens mouth to talk. Digital thermometer. 
Leave in place until the thermometer blinks or beeps. Electronic thermometer. Leave in place until you hear a tone or see a flashing or steady light. Mercury-free thermometer. Leave in place for at least three minutes. Figure 7-11. Caption. While the thermometer is in the resident's mouth, she should keep her lips closed. 9. Digital thermometer. Remove the thermometer. Read the temperature on the display screen. Remember the temperature reading. Electronic thermometer. Read the temperature on the display screen. Remember the temperature reading. Remove the probe. Mercury-free thermometer. Remove the thermometer. Wipe it with a tissue from stem to bulb or remove the sheath. Discard the tissue or sheath. Hold the thermometer at eye level. Rotate until the line appears, rolling the thermometer between your thumb and forefinger. Read the temperature. Remember the temperature reading. 10. Digital thermometer. Using a tissue, remove and discard the sheath. Replace the thermometer in the case. Electronic thermometer. Press the eject button to discard the cover. Return the probe to the holder. Mercury-free thermometer. Clean thermometer according to facility guidelines. Rinse with clean water and dry. Return it to case. 11. Remove and discard gloves. 12. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 13. Immediately record the temperature, date, time, and method used. Oral. Record temperature immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 14. Place call light within residence reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 15. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. The NA must always explain what she will do before starting to measure a rectal temperature. The NA needs the resident's cooperation. She should ask the resident to hold still and reassure him that the task will only take a few minutes. It is important to hold on to the thermometer at all times while the thermometer is in the rectum. Procedure. Measuring and recording a rectal temperature. Equipment needed. Clean, rectal digital, electronic, or mercury-free thermometer. Lubricant. Gloves. Tissue. Disposable sheath. Cover. Pen and paper. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Adjust bed to a safe level, usually waist high. Lock bed wheels. Promote safety. 6. Help the resident to the left lying, Sims position. Figure 7-12, caption. The resident must be in the left lying, Sims position. 7. Fold back the linens to expose only the rectal area. 8. Put on gloves. 9. Digital thermometer. Put on the disposable sheath. Turn on the thermometer and wait until the ready sign appears. Electronic thermometer. Remove the probe from the base unit. Put on the probe cover. Mercury-free thermometer. Hold the thermometer by the stem. Shake the thermometer down to below the lowest number. 10. Apply a small amount of lubricant to the tip of the bulb or probe cover, or apply pre-lubricated cover. 11. Separate the buttocks. Gently insert the thermometer into the rectum one half to one inch. Stop if you meet resistance. Do not force the thermometer into the rectum. Figure 7-13, caption. Gently insert a rectal thermometer one half to one inch into the rectum. 12. Replace the sheet over the buttocks. Hold on to the thermometer at all times. 13. Digital thermometer. Leave in place until the thermometer blinks or beeps. Electronic thermometer. Leave in place until you hear a tone or see a flashing or steady light. Mercury-free thermometer. Leave in place for at least three minutes. 14. Gently remove the thermometer. Wipe it with a tissue from stem to bulb or remove the sheath. Discard the tissue or sheath. 15. Read the thermometer at eye level as you would for an oral temperature. Remember the temperature reading. 16. Digital thermometer. Clean the thermometer according to policy and replace it in the case. Electronic thermometer. Press the eject button to discard the cover. Return the probe to the holder. Mercury-free thermometer. Clean thermometer according to facility guidelines. Rinse with clean water and dry. Return it to case. 17. Remove and discard gloves. 18. Assist the resident to a comfortable and safe position. Return bed to lowest position. 19. Wash your hands. 
provides for infection prevention. 20. Immediately record the temperature, date, time, and method used. Rectal. Record temperature immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 21. Place call light within residence reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 22. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. Tympanic thermometers can take a fast temperature reading. The NA should tell the resident that she will be placing a thermometer in the ear canal. She should reassure the resident that this is painless. The short tip of the thermometer will only go into the ear one fourth to one half inch. Procedure. Measuring and recording a tympanic temperature. Equipment needed. Tympanic thermometer. Gloves. Disposable probe sheath. Cover. Pen and paper. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Put on gloves. 6. Put a disposable sheath over the earpiece of the thermometer. Protects equipment. Reduces risk of contamination. 7. Position the resident's head so that the ear is in front of you. Straighten the ear canal by gently pulling up and back on the outside edge of the ear. Insert the covered probe into the ear canal. Press the button. Figure 7-14. Caption. Straighten the ear canal by gently pulling up and back on the outside edge of the ear. 8. Hold the thermometer in place until it blinks or beeps. 9. Read the temperature. Remember the temperature reading. 10. Discard sheath. Return thermometer to storage or to the battery charger if thermometer is rechargeable. 11. Remove and discard gloves. 12. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 13. Immediately record the temperature, date, time, and method used to panic. Record temperature immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 14. Place call light within residence reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 15. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. Axillary temperatures are not as accurate as temperatures taken at other sites. However, they can be safer if a resident is confused, disoriented, uncooperative, or has dementia. Procedure. Measuring and recording an axillary temperature. Equipment needed. Clean, digital, electronic, or mercury-free thermometer. Gloves. Tissues. Disposable sheath. Cover. Pen and paper. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Put on gloves. 6. Remove the resident's arm from the sleeve of gown to allow skin contact with the end of the thermometer. Wipe the axillary area with tissues before placing the thermometer. 7. Digital thermometer. Put on the disposable sheath. Turn on the thermometer and wait until the ready sign appears. Electronic thermometer. Remove the probe from the base unit. Put on the probe cover. Mercury-free thermometer. Hold the thermometer by the stem. Shake the thermometer down to below the lowest number. 8. Position the thermometer, bulb end for mercury-free, in the center of the armpit. Fold the resident's arm over his chest. Figure 7-15. Caption. After inserting the thermometer, fold the resident's arm over his chest and hold it in place for 8 to 10 minutes. 9. Digital thermometer. Leave in place until the thermometer blinks or beeps. Electronic thermometer. Leave in place until you hear a tone or see a flashing or steady light. Mercury-free thermometer. Leave in place with the arm close against the side for 8 to 10 minutes. 10. Digital thermometer. Remove the thermometer. Read the temperature on the display screen. Remember the temperature reading. Electronic thermometer. Read the temperature on the display screen. Remember the temperature reading. Remove the probe. Mercury-free thermometer. Remove the thermometer. Wipe it with a tissue from stem to bulb or remove the sheath. 
Discard the tissue or sheath. Read the thermometer at eye level as you would for an oral temperature. Remember the temperature reading. 11. Digital thermometer. Using a tissue, remove and discard the sheath. Replace a thermometer in the case. Electronic thermometer. Press the eject button to discard the cover. Return the probe to the holder. Mercury-free thermometer. Clean thermometer according to facility guidelines. Rinse with clean water and dry. Return it to case. 12. Remove and discard gloves. 13. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 14. Put resident arm back into sleeve of gown. 15. Immediately record the temperature, date, time, and method used. Axillary. Record temperature immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 16. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 17. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. Pulse. The pulse is the number of heartbeats per minute. The beat that is felt at certain pulse points in the body represents the wave of blood moving as a result of the heart pumping. The most common site for checking the pulse is on the inside of the wrist, where the radial artery runs just beneath the skin. This is called the radial pulse. The brachial pulse is the pulse inside the elbow. It is about one to one and a half inches above the elbow. The radial and brachial pulses are involved in taking blood pressure. Blood pressure is explained later in this chapter. Common pulse sites are shown in figure 7-16 below. Figure 7-16, caption, common pulse sites. For adults, the normal pulse rate is 60 to 100 beats per minute. Small children have faster pulses in the range of 100 to 120 beats per minute. A newborn baby's pulse may be as high as 120 to 180 beats per minute. Many things can affect the pulse rate. These include exercise, fear, anger, anxiety, heat, infection, illness, medications, and pain. A high or low rate may not indicate disease. However, sometimes the pulse rate can signal that illness exists. For example, a rapid pulse may result from fever, dehydration, or heart failure. A slow or weak pulse may indicate infection. Respirations. Respiration is the process of inhaling air into the lungs, or inspiration, and exhaling air out of the lungs, or expiration. Each respiration consists of an inspiration and an expiration. The chest rises during inspiration and falls during expiration. The normal respiration rate for adults ranges from 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Infants and children have a faster respiratory rate. Infants normally breathe at a rate of 30 to 40 respirations per minute. Respirations are usually counted directly after counting the pulse rate. This is because people may breathe more quickly if they know they are being observed. The NA should keep her fingers on the resident's wrist or on the stethoscope over the heart. She should not make it obvious that she is watching the resident's breathing. She should not mention she is counting respirations. Procedure. Counting and recording radial pulse and counting and recording respirations. Equipment needed. Watch with a second hand. Pen and paper. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident right to privacy and dignity. 5. Place the tips of your index finger and middle finger on the thumb side of the resident's wrist. Locate the radial pulse. Figure 7-17. Caption. Count the radial pulse by placing the tips of your index finger and middle finger on the thumb side of the wrist. 6. Count the beats for one full minute. 7. Keep your fingertips on the resident's wrist. Count respirations for one full minute. Observe the pattern and character of the resident's breathing. Normal breathing is smooth and quiet. If you see signs of troubled, shallow, or noisy breathing, such as wheezing, report it. Count will be more accurate if resident does not know you are counting his respirations. 8. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 9. Immediately record the pulse rate, date, time, and method used, radial. Record the respiratory rate and the pattern or character of breathing. Record pulse and respiration rate immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 10. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 11. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Report to the nurse if the pulse is less than 60 beats per minute, over 100 beats per minute, if the rhythm is irregular, or if breathing is irregular. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 
Blood pressure. Blood pressure is an important indicator of health. The measurement shows how well the heart is working. Blood pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury, mmHg. It is recorded as a fraction, for example, 120 over 80. There are two parts of blood pressure, the systolic measurement and the diastolic measurement. In the systolic phase, which is the top number of the reading, the heart is at work. It contracts and pushes blood from the left ventricle of the heart. The reading shows the pressure on the walls of the arteries as blood is pumped through the body. The normal range for systolic blood pressure is below 120 millimeters of mercury. The second measurement reflects the diastolic phase, which is the bottom number of the reading. This is when the heart relaxes. The diastolic measurement is always lower than the systolic measurement. It shows the pressure in the arteries when the heart is at rest. The normal range for adults is below 80 millimeters of mercury. People with consistently high blood pressure or hypertension have elevated systolic and or diastolic blood pressures. In late 2017, the American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology released new joint guidelines for blood pressure. A systolic reading of 130 millimeters of mercury or higher, or a diastolic reading of 80 millimeters of mercury or higher, is now considered high blood pressure. Previously, a person was considered to have high blood pressure when the blood pressure reading was 140 over 90 or above. Systolic and diastolic readings do not both need to be high for a reading to be considered high. A systolic reading of 130 millimeters of mercury or higher, or a diastolic reading of 80 millimeters of mercury or higher should be reported. Blood pressure is affected by many factors. These include aging, exercise, stress, pain, medications, illness, obesity, alcohol intake, tobacco products, and the volume of blood in circulation. Blood pressure is measured with either a manual or digital sphygmomanometer. A manual sphygmomanometer requires the use of a stethoscope to determine the blood pressure reading. With a digital sphygmomanometer, the systolic and diastolic pressure readings are displayed digitally. The use of a stethoscope is not required with a digital sphygmomanometer. Figure 7-18, caption. The top photo shows two types of manual sphygmomanometers. The bottom photo shows a type of digital sphygmomanometer that measures blood pressure as well as other vital signs. When measuring blood pressure, the first sound heard is the systolic pressure, top number. When the sound changes to a soft muffled thump or disappears, this is the diastolic pressure, bottom number. Blood pressure should not be measured on an arm that has an IV, a dialysis shunt, or any medical equipment. A side that has a cast, recent trauma, paralysis, burns, or has had breast surgery, mastectomy, should be avoided. It is important to use a cuff that is the correct size when measuring blood pressure. Available sizes for adults include small adult, adult, large adult, and thigh. Procedure. Measuring and recording blood pressure, one-step method. Equipment needed, sphygmomanometer, stethoscope, alcohol wipes, pen and paper. One, identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. Two, wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. Three, explain procedure to the resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. Four, provide for residents' privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains residents' right to privacy and dignity. Five, before using the stethoscope, wipe the diaphragm and earpieces with alcohol wipes. Reduces pathogens, prevents ear infections, and prevents spread of infection. Six, ask the resident to roll up his sleeve so that the upper arm is exposed. Do not measure blood pressure over clothing. Seven, Position the resident's arm with his palm up. The arm should be level with the heart. A false low reading is possible if arm is above heart level. 8. With the valve open, squeeze the cuff. Make sure it is completely deflated. 9. Place the blood pressure cuff snugly on the resident's upper arm. The center of the cuff with sensor arrow is placed over the brachial artery, 1 to 1 and a half inches above the elbow, toward the inside of the elbow. Cuff must be proper size and put on arm correctly so amount of pressure on artery is correct. If not, reading will be falsely high or low. Figure 7-19, caption, place the center of the cuff over the brachial artery. 10, locate the brachial pulse with your fingertips. 11, place the earpieces of the stethoscope in your ears. 12, place the diaphragm of the stethoscope over the brachial artery. 13, close the valve clockwise until it stops. Do not over tighten it. Tight valves are hard to release. Figure 7-20, caption, Close the valve by turning it clockwise until it stops. Do not over tighten it. 14. Inflate the cuff to between 160 millimeters of mercury to 180 millimeters of mercury. If a beat is heard immediately upon cuff deflation,
completely deflate the cuff. Reinflate the cuff to no more than 200 millimeters of mercury. 15. Open the valve slightly with the thumb and index finger. Deflate the cuff slowly. Releasing the valve slowly allows you to hear beats accurately. 16. Watch the gauge. Listen for the sound of the pulse. 17. Remember the reading at which the first pulse sound is heard. This is the systolic pressure. 18. Continue listening for a change or muffling of pulse sound. The point of a change or the point at which the sound disappears is the diastolic pressure. Remember this reading. 19. Open the valve. Deflate the cuff completely. Remove the cuff. An inflated cuff left on resident arm can cause numbness and tingling. If you must take blood pressure again, completely deflate cuff and wait 30 seconds. Never partially deflate a cuff and then pump it up again. Blood vessels will be damaged and reading will be falsely high or low. 20. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 21. Immediately record both the systolic and diastolic pressures. Record the numbers like a fraction, with the systolic reading on top and the diastolic reading on the bottom. For example, 120 over 80. Note which arm was used. Use RA for right arm and LA for left arm. Record readings immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 22. Wipe diaphragm and earpieces of stethoscope with alcohol wipes. Store equipment. 23. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 24. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 25. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. If using a digital sigma manometer, the NA will place the cuff on the resident's upper arm with the center of the cuff over the brachial artery. A start button may need to be pressed. Usually the cuff inflates on its own and then deflates once the blood pressure measurement has been obtained. The reading will appear on the screen. In addition to other vital sign measurements, some NAs may be asked to obtain a pulse oximeter reading. A pulse oximeter is a device that uses a light to determine the amount of oxygen in the blood. A pulse oximeter also measures a person's pulse rate. Figure 7-21. Caption. A pulse oximeter sensor is usually clipped on a person's finger to measure the amount of oxygen in the blood, as well as pulse rate. A pulse oximeter may be used when residents have had surgery, are on oxygen, are in intensive care, or have cardiac or respiratory problems. When asked to obtain this reading, the NA should report the oxygen percentage to the nurse. The nurse will determine if the level is adequate for the resident. Pain management. Pain is sometimes referred to as the fifth vital sign because it is as important to monitor as the other vital signs. However, pain is different in that it is subjective, something reported by the person. The other vital signs are objective measurements, information collected by using the senses. Pain is also a personal experience, which means it is different for each person. Pain is uncomfortable. It can quickly drain energy and hope. NA spend the most time with residents. They play an important role in pain monitoring, management, and prevention. Care plans are made based on NA's reports. Pain is not a normal part of aging. Chronic pain may lead to withdrawal, depression, and isolation. NAs must treat residents' complaints of pain seriously. They should listen to what residents are saying about the way they feel. They should take action to help them. The following are questions that nurses may ask residents to assess their pain. A nurse may ask an NA to ask these questions and then immediately report the information to the nurse. Where is the pain? When did the pain start? How long does the pain last and how often does it occur? How severe is the pain? To help find out, the resident may be asked to rate the pain on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being no pain and 10 being the worst pain. Figure 7-22, caption. This is one type of pain scale that nurses may use to assess pain levels. Can you describe the pain? The NA should use the resident's words when reporting to the nurse. What makes the pain better? What makes the pain worse? What were you doing when the pain started? Residents may have concerns about their pain. These concerns may make them hesitant to report their pain. Barriers to managing pain include the following. Fear of addiction to pain medication. Feeling that pain is a normal part of aging. Worrying about constipation and fatigue from pain medication. Feeling that caregivers are too busy to deal with their pain. Feeling that too much pain medication will cause death. NA should be patient and caring when helping residents who are in pain. If residents are worried about the effects of pain medication or have questions about it, the NA should tell the nurse. Some people do not feel comfortable saying that they are in pain. A person's culture affects how he or she responds to pain. In some cultures, there is a belief that it is best not to react to pain. In other cultures, people are encouraged to express pain freely. Body language or other messages that a resident may be in pain are important for the NA to observe. Guidelines. Pain management. 
Report complaints of pain or unrelieved pain immediately. Gently position the body in proper alignment. Use pillows for support. Help with changes of position if the resident wishes. Give back rubs. Ask if the resident would like to take a warm bath or shower. Help the resident to the bathroom or commode or offer the bedpan or urinal. Encourage slow, deep breathing. Provide a calm and quiet environment. Soft music may distract the resident. Be patient, caring, gentle, and responsive. Observing and reporting, pain. Report any of these to the nurse. Increased pulse, respirations, blood pressure, sweating, nausea, vomiting, tightening the jaw, squeezing eyes shut, holding or guarding a body part, frowning, grinding teeth, increased restlessness, agitation or tension, change in behavior, crying, sighing, groaning, breathing heavily, rocking, pacing, repetitive movements, difficulty moving or walking. Learning objective three, explain how to measure weight and height. NAs measure weight and height as part of regular care. Height is checked less often than weight. Weight changes can be signs of illness. NAs must report any weight loss or gain, no matter how small. Weight will be measured using pounds or kilograms. A pound is a unit of weight equal to 16 ounces. A kilogram is a unit of mass equal to 1,000 grams. One kilogram equals 2.2 pounds. Procedure. Measuring and recording weight of an ambulatory resident. Equipment needed. Standing, upright, scale. Pen and paper. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promote understanding and independence. 4. Provide for residents' privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains residents' right to privacy and dignity. 5. Make sure the resident is wearing non-skid shoes that are fastened before walking to the scale. 6. Start with the scale balanced at zero before weighing the resident. Scale must be balanced on zero for weight to be accurate. 7. Help the resident to step onto the center of the scale. Be sure she is not holding, touching, or leaning against anything. This interferes with weight measurement. 8. Determine the resident's weight. Balance the scale by making the balance bar level. Move the small and large weight indicators until the bar balances. Read the two numbers shown on the small and large weight indicators when the bar is balanced. Add these two numbers together. This is the resident's weight. Figure 7-23. Caption. Move the small and large weight indicators until the bar balances. The weight shown in the illustration is 169 pounds. 9. Help the resident to safely step off the scale before recording weight. Protects against falls. 10. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 11. Immediately record the resident's weight in pounds, LB, or kilograms, KG, depending on facility policy. Record weight immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 12. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 13. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. Some residents will not be able to get out of wheelchairs easily. These residents may be weighed on a wheelchair scale. With this scale, wheelchairs are rolled directly onto the scale. On some wheelchair scales, the NA will need to subtract the weight of the wheelchair from a resident's weight. If the wheelchair weight is not listed on the chair, the NA should weigh the empty wheelchair first. The footrests should be attached if they will be attached when the resident is in the chair. Then the NA should subtract the wheelchair's weight from the total. Figure 7-24. Caption. Wheelchairs can be rolled directly onto wheelchair scales to determine weight. Photo courtesy of Detecto, www.detecto.com, 800-641-2008. When residents are not able to get out of bed, they are weighed on special bed scales. Before using a bed scale, the NA should know how to use it properly and safely. Figure 7-25, caption, a type of bed scale. Photo courtesy of Detecto, www.detecto.com, 800-641-2008. For measuring height, there is a rod attached to the scale. The rod measures in inches and fractions of inches. The NA should record the total number of inches. If inches need to be converted into feet, there are 12 inches in one foot. Procedure, measuring and recording height of an ambulatory resident. For residents who can get out of bed, you will measure height using a standing scale. Equipment needed. 
Standing scale. Pen and paper. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Make sure the resident is wearing non-skid shoes that are securely fastened before walking to the scale. 6. Help the resident to step onto the scale, facing away from the scale. 7. Ask the resident to stand straight if possible. Help as needed. Ensures accurate reading. 8. Pull up the measuring rod from the back of the scale. Gently lower the rod until it rests flat on the resident's head. Figure 7-26. Caption. To determine height on a standing scale, gently lower the measuring rod until it rests flat on the resident's head. 9. Determine the resident's height. 10. Help the resident to step off the scale before recording height. Make sure the measuring rod does not hit the resident in the head while doing so. 11. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 12. Immediately record the resident's height. Record height immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. 13. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 14. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. Some residents will be unable to get out of bed. Height can be measured by using a tape measure and making two pencil marks on the sheet that is underneath the resident. The NA makes a mark at the top of the resident's head and one at his feet and measures the distance between the marks. Height of a resident who is bedridden can also be measured using other methods. NA should follow the procedure used at their facilities. Figure 7-27. Caption. Height can be measured in bed using a tape measure. Figure 7-28. Caption. One way that the height of a resident who is bedridden can be measured is by making marks on the sheet at the resident's head and heel. Then the distance between the marks is measured. Learning Objective 4. Explain restraints and how to promote a restraint-free environment. A restraint is a physical or chemical way to restrict voluntary movement or behavior. A physical restraint is any method, device, material, or equipment that restricts a person's freedom of movement. Types of physical restraints include vest restraints, belt restraints, wrist ankle restraints, and mitt restraints. Chemical restraints are medications used to control a person's mood or behavior. An enabler is equipment or a device that promotes a resident's safety, comfort, independence, and mobility. Wheelchairs, geriatric chairs, cushions and pillows, and certain types of assisted devices, such as special utensils, are examples of enablers. However, if a person cannot remove an enabler independently, it may be considered a restraint. Raised side rails on beds and geriatric chairs with tray tables attached may be considered enablers or physical restraints. This depends upon their intended use and the resident's condition or abilities. In the past, restraints were commonly used to prevent confused people from wandering or to prevent falls. They were used to keep people from injuring themselves or others, or to prevent people from pulling out tubing needed for treatment. Restraints were often overused by caregivers. Residents were injured. This led to new laws restricting the use of restraints. Figure 7-29, caption. Raised side rails may be considered restraints. It depends on their intended use and on the resident's abilities. Figure 7-30, caption. If a resident cannot remove an attached tray table, a geriatric chair may be considered a restraint. Today, long-term care facilities are prohibited from using restraints unless they are medically necessary. They are only used as a last resort. They are only used after other measures have been tried. If a restraint is needed, a doctor must order it. Very specific guidelines apply to carrying out a restraint order. This includes frequent monitoring of the resident. This is important because residents have been severely injured and have died due to improper restraint use and lack of monitoring. NAs cannot use a physical restraint unless the doctor has ordered it in the care plan and they have been trained in the restraint's use. It is against the law for staff to apply a restraint for convenience or to discipline a resident. NAs can check with their supervisor for policies regarding restraints. There are many serious problems that occur with restraint use. They include the following. Pressure injuries. Pneumonia. Risk of suffocation. Suffocation is the stoppage of breathing from a lack of oxygen or excess carbon dioxide in the body. It may result in unconsciousness or death. Reduced blood circulation, stress on the heart, incontinence, constipation, weakened muscles and bones, muscle atrophy, weakening or wasting away of the muscle, loss of bone mass, poor appetite and malnutrition, depression and or withdrawal.
sleep disorders, loss of dignity, loss of independence, stress and anxiety, increased agitation, anxiety, restlessness, loss of self-esteem, severe injury, death. Restraint usage has significantly decreased in facilities. State and federal agencies encourage facilities to take steps to create restraint-free environments. Restraint-free care means that restraints are not kept or used for any reason. Creative ideas that help avoid the need for restraints are being used instead. Restraint alternatives are measures used in place of a restraint or that reduce the need for a restraint. Examples of restraint alternatives include the following. Make sure call lights are within reach. Respond to call lights promptly. Improve safety measures to prevent accidents and falls. Improve lighting. Ambulate the resident when he is restless. The doctor or nurse may add exercise into the care plan. Provide activities for those who wander at night. Encourage activities and independence. Escort the resident to social activities. Increase visits and social interaction. Give frequent help with elimination needs. Help with cleaning immediately after an episode of incontinence. Offer food or drink. Offer reading materials. Distract or redirect interest. Give the resident a repetitive task. Decrease the noise level. Listen to soothing music. Offer massage or use relaxation techniques. Reduce pain levels through medication. The resident should be monitored closely. Complaints of pain should be reported immediately. Provide familiar caregivers. Increase the number of caregivers by using family and volunteers. Use a team approach to meeting needs. Offer training to teach gentle approaches to difficult people. There are also several types of pads, belts, special chairs, and alarms that can be used instead of restraints. If a resident is ordered to have an alarm on his bed or chair, the NA should make sure it is there and is turned on. OBRA sets specific rules for restraint use. Restraints are used only after everything else has been ruled out and can only be applied with a doctor's order. An NA cannot use a restraint unless the charge nurse has approved its use and the NA has been trained to use it properly. If a restraint has been ordered, the NA must place the call light where the resident can easily access it. She should answer call lights immediately. A restrained resident must be monitored constantly. He must be checked at least every 15 minutes following facility policy. At a minimum, the restraint must be released every two hours and the resident must be given proper care. Help with elimination needs. Check for episodes of incontinence. Provide skin care. Offer fluids and food. Measure vital signs. Check the skin for signs of irritation. Report any red, purple, blue, gray, or pale skin or any discolored areas to the nurse immediately. Check for swelling of body parts and report any swelling immediately. Reposition the resident. Ambulate the resident if he is able. If any problems occur with the restraint, especially injury, the NA should notify the nurse and complete an incident report as soon as possible. Learning Objective 5. Define fluid balance and explain intake and output, I and O. To maintain health, the body must take in a certain amount of fluid each day. Fluid comes in the form of liquids that a person drinks. It is also found in semi-liquid foods like gelatin, soup, ice cream, pudding, and yogurt. The fluid a person consumes is called intake or input. A general recommendation for daily fluid intake is 64 ounces or eight eight ounce glasses for a healthy person. However, that is not necessarily a firm guideline for health. Some people may need more than 64 ounces while others may need less. The amount needed depends on factors such as activity, heat, and overall health. All fluid taken in each day cannot stay in the body. It must be eliminated as output. Output includes urine, feces, including diarrhea, and vomitus. It also includes perspiration, moisture in the air that a person exhales, and wound drainage. Fluid balance is maintaining equal input and output, or taking in and eliminating equal amounts of fluids. Most people do this naturally, but some residents must have their intake and output, or I and O, monitored and recorded. To do this, the NA will need to measure and document all food and fluids the resident takes by mouth, as well as all urine and vomitus produced. This is recorded on an intake and output I and O sheet. Figure 7-31, caption. This is one type of intake output sheet. Orange box 7-2, conversions. Milliliters, lowercase m, uppercase l, are units of measurement in the metric system. One milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter. Ounces, OZ, are converted to milliliters. One ounce equals 30 milliliters. To convert ounces to milliliters, the number of ounces must be multiplied by 30. One ounce equals 30 milliliters. Two ounces equals 60 milliliters. Three ounces equals 90 milliliters. Four ounces equals 120 milliliters. Five ounces equals 150 milliliters. Six ounces equals 180 milliliters. 
7 ounces equals 210 milliliters. 8 ounces equals 240 milliliters. 1 quarter cup equals 2 ounces equals 60 milliliters. 1 half cup equals 4 ounces equals 120 milliliters. 1 cup equals 8 ounces equals 240 milliliters. Procedure. Measuring and recording urinary output. Equipment needed. Intake and output sheet. Graduate. Measuring container. Gloves. Pen and paper. 1. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 2. Put on gloves before handling bedpan, urinal. 3. Pour the contents of the bedpan or urinal into the graduate. Do not spill or splash any of the urine. 4. Place the graduate on a flat surface. Measure the amount of urine at eye level. Keep the container level. Note the amount on paper, converting to milliliters if necessary. If the amount is between measurement lines, you may need to round up to the nearest 25 milliliters. Follow policy. A flat surface helps get an accurate reading. Figure 7-32, caption. Keep the container level on a flat surface while measuring output. 5. After measuring urine, empty the graduate into the toilet. Do not splash urine. Reduces risk of contamination. 6. Rinse the graduate. Pour rinse water into the toilet. 7. Rinse the bedpan, urinal. Pour rinse water into the toilet. Flush the toilet. 8. Place graduate and bedpan, urinal in area for cleaning, or clean and store according to facility policy. 9. Remove and discard gloves. 10. Wash hands before recording output. Provides for infection prevention. 11. Immediately document the time and amount of urine in output column on sheet. For example, 1,545 hours, 200 milliliters urine. Record amount immediately so you won't forget. Care plans are made based on your report. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. 12. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. Collecting specimens. NAs may need to collect a specimen from a resident. A specimen is a sample that is used for analysis in order to try to make a diagnosis. Different types of specimens are used for different tests. Different types of specimens that NAs may be asked to collect include the following. Urine, routine, clean catch, midstream, or 24-hour. Stool, feces, sputum, mucus coughed up from the lungs. A routine urine specimen is collected any time the resident voids or urinates. The resident will void into a bedpan, urinal, commode, or hat. A hat is a plastic collection container sometimes put into a toilet bowl to collect and measure urine or stool. Some residents will be able to collect their own specimens. Others will need help. The seal must be intact on specimen containers before they are used. This helps avoid specimen contamination. All specimens must be labeled with the resident's first and last name, date of birth, room number, and the date and time the specimen was collected. Figure 7-33, caption. A hat is a container that is sometimes placed under the toilet seat to collect a specimen. Hats should be labeled. They must be cleaned after each use. Resident Rights Box 7-4, Specimens. Body wastes and elimination needs are very private matters for most people. Having another person handle their body wastes may make residents embarrassed. NAs should be sensitive to this. They should empathize with residents. When collecting specimens, the NA should be professional. If she feels that this is an unpleasant task, she should not make it known. She should not make faces or frown. She should not use words that let the resident know that she feels uncomfortable. Remaining professional when collecting specimens can help put residents at ease. Procedure. Collecting a routine urine specimen. Equipment needed. Urine specimen container and lid. Completed label. Labeled with resident's name, date of birth, room number, date and time. Specimen bag. Two pairs of gloves. Bedpan or urinal, if resident cannot use portable commode or toilet. Hat for toilet. If resident uses portable commode or toilet, plastic bag, toilet paper, disposable wipes, paper towels, supplies for perineal care, lab slip. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to the resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Put on gloves. Prevents you from coming into contact with body fluids. 6. Fit the hat to toilet or commode, or provide resident with bedpan or urinal. 
7. Ask the resident to void into the hat, urinal, or bedpan. Ask the resident not to put toilet paper in with the sample. Provide a plastic bag to discard toilet paper separately. Paper ruins the sample. 8. Make sure bed is in its lowest position. Place toilet paper and disposable wipes within resident's reach. Ask the resident to clean his hands with a wipe when finished if he is able. 9. Remove and discard gloves. Wash your hands. 10. Place the call light within resident's reach. Ask the resident to signal when done. Leave the room and close the door. Promotes resident's privacy and dignity. 11. When called by the resident, return and wash your hands. Put on clean gloves. Give perineal care if help is needed. 12. Take bedpan, urinal, or hat to the bathroom. 13. Pour urine into the specimen container. Specimen container should be at least half full. 14. Cover the urine container with its lid. Do not touch the inside of the container. Wipe off the outside with a paper towel. Discard the paper towel. Prevents contamination. 15. Apply label. Place the container in a clean specimen bag. Seal the bag. Provide for safe transport. Figure 7-34, caption. Specimens must always be labeled with the resident's name, date of birth, room number, the date and time before being taken to the lab. A specimen may need to be placed in a clean specimen bag before transporting it. 16. Discard extra urine in the toilet. Turn the faucet on with a paper towel. Rinse the bedpan, urinal, or hat with cold water and empty it into the toilet. Flush the toilet. Place equipment in proper area for cleaning or clean it according to facility policy. 17. Remove and discard gloves. 18. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 19. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 20. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 21. Take specimen and lab slip to proper area. Document procedure using facility guidelines. Note amount and characteristics of urine. If you do not document the care, legally, it did not happen. A clean catch specimen or midstream specimen, CCMS, does not include the first and last urine in the sample. Its purpose is to determine the presence of bacteria in the urine. Procedure, collecting a clean catch midstream urine specimen. Equipment needed, specimen kit with container and lid. Completed label, labeled with resident's name, date of birth, room number, date and time. Specimen bag, cleansing wipes. Gloves, bedpan or urinal, if resident cannot use portable commode or toilet, plastic bag, toilet paper, disposable wipes, paper towels, towels, supplies for perineal care, lap slip. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promote understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Put on gloves. Prevents you from coming into contact with body fluids. 6. Open the specimen kit. Do not touch the inside of the container or the inside of the lid. Prevents contamination. 7. If the resident cannot clean his or her perineal area, you will do it. Use the cleansing wipes to do this. Be sure to use a clean area of the wipe or clean wipe for each stroke. See the bed bath procedure in chapter six for a reminder on how to give perineal care. Improper cleaning can infect urinary tract and contaminate the sample. Eight, ask the resident to urinate a small amount into the bedpan, urinal, or toilet and to stop before urination is complete. Nine, place the container under the urine stream. Have the resident start urinating again. Fill the container at least half full. Ask the resident to stop urinating and remove the container. Have the resident finish urinating in bedpan, urinal, or toilet. 10. After urination, provide a plastic bag so the resident can discard toilet paper. Give perineal care if help is needed. Ask the resident to clean his hands with a wipe if he is able. 11. Cover the urine container with its lid. Do not touch the inside of the container. Wipe off the outside with a paper towel. Discard the paper towel. 12. Apply label. Place the container in a clean specimen bag. Seal the bag. Provide for safe transport. 13. Discard extra urine in the toilet. Turn the faucet on with a paper towel. Rinse the bedpan or urinal with cold water and empty it into the toilet. 
Flush the toilet. Place equipment in proper area for cleaning, or clean it according to facility policy. 14. Remove and discard gloves. 15. Wash your hands. Promotes infection prevention. 16. Place call light within residence reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 17. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 18. Take specimen and lab slip to proper area. Document procedure using facility guidelines. Note amount and characteristics of urine. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. The NA should ask the resident to let her know when he can have a bowel movement. She should be ready to collect the specimen. Procedure. Collecting a stool specimen. Equipment needed. Specimen container and lid. Completed label. Labeled with resident's name. Date of birth. Room number. Date and time. Specimen bag. Two pairs of gloves. Two tongue blades. Bedpan. If resident cannot use portable commode or toilet. Hat for toilet. If resident uses portable commode or toilet. Plastic bag. Toilet paper. Disposable wipes. Paper towels. Supplies for perineal care. Lab slip. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains residents' right to privacy and dignity. 5. Put on gloves. Prevents you from coming into contact with body fluids. 6. Ask the resident not to urinate when he is ready to move his bowels. Ask him not to put toilet paper in with the sample. Provide a plastic bag to discard toilet paper separately. Urine and paper ruin the sample. 7. Fit hat to toilet or commode or provide resident with bedpan. 8. Make sure bed is in its lowest position. Place toilet paper and disposable wipes within resident's reach. Ask the resident to clean his hands with a wipe when finished if he is able. 9. Remove and discard gloves. Wash your hands. Promotes infection prevention. 10. Place the call light within resident's reach. Ask the resident to signal when done. Leave the room and close the door. Promotes resident's privacy and dignity. 11. When called by the resident, return and wash your hands. Put on clean gloves. Give perineal care if help is needed. 12. Using the two tongue blades, take about two tablespoons of stool and put it in the container. Without touching the inside of the container, cover it tightly. Apply the label and place the container in a clean specimen bag. Seal the bag. Prevents contamination. 13. Wrap the tongue blades in toilet paper. Put them in the plastic bag with the used toilet paper. Discard bag in proper container. 14. Empty the bedpan or container into the toilet. Turn the faucet on with a paper towel. Rinse the bedpan with cold water and empty it into the toilet. Flush the toilet. Place equipment in the proper area for cleaning or clean it according to facility policy. 15. Remove and discard gloves. 16. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 17. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 18. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 19. Take specimen and lab slip to proper area. Document procedure using facility guidelines. Note amount and characteristics of stool. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. Sputum specimens are collected to check for respiratory problems or illness. Early morning is the best time to collect sputum. The resident should cough up the sputum and spit it directly into the specimen container. Proper personal protective equipment, PPE, must be worn when collecting sputum. The required PPE are gloves and a special mask. Chapter 7. Continued. Learning Objective 6. Explain care guidelines for urinary catheters, oxygen therapy, and IV therapy. A catheter is a thin tube inserted into the body that is used to drain fluids or inject fluids. A urinary catheter is used to drain urine from the bladder. A straight catheter is a type of catheter that is inserted to drain urine from the bladder. It is removed immediately after urine is drained. It does not remain inside the person. An indwelling catheter, also called a Foley catheter, remains inside the bladder for a period of time. The urine drains into a bag. Figure 7-35, caption, an illustration of A, an indwelling catheter, female, and B, an indwelling catheter, male. Another catheter that is used for males is an external or condom catheter, also called a Texas catheter. 
It has an attachment on the end that fits onto the penis and is fastened with special tape. Urine drains through the catheter into the tubing, then into the drainage bag. A smaller bag, called a leg bag, attaches to the leg and collects the urine. The condom catheter is changed daily or as needed. Nursing assistants do not insert, remove, or irrigate catheters. NAs may be asked to give daily catheter care, clean the area around the urethral opening, and empty the drainage bag. Guidelines. Urinary catheters. Thoroughly wash your hands before giving catheter care. Keep the genital area clean to prevent infection. Because the catheter goes all the way into the bladder, bacteria can enter the bladder more easily. Daily care of the genital area, perineal care, is especially important. Make sure that the drainage bag always hangs lower than the hips or bladder. Urine must never flow from the bag or tubing back into the bladder. This can cause infection. Keep the drainage bag off the floor. Make sure the catheter tubing does not touch the floor. Keep the tubing as straight as possible. It should not be kinked. Observing and reporting urinary catheters. Report any of these to the nurse. Blood in the urine or urine that looks unusual in any way. Catheter bag does not fill after several hours. Catheter bag fills suddenly. Catheter is not in place. Urine leaks from the catheter. Resident reports pain or pressure. Odor is present. Procedure. Providing catheter care. Equipment needed. Bath blanket. Disposable bed protector. Bath basin with warm water. Soap. Bath thermometer. Two to four washcloths or disposable wipes. Towel. Gloves. One. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. Two. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. Three. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promote understanding and independence. Four. Provide for resident privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. Five. Adjust bed to a safe level, usually waist high. Lock bed wheels. Prevents injury to you and to resident. Six. Lower the head of the bed. Position the resident lying flat on her back. Seven. Remove or fold back top bedding. Keep the resident covered with the bath blanket. Promotes resident's privacy. Eight. Test water temperature with a thermometer or against the inside of your wrist. Water temperature should be no higher than 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Have resident check water temperature. Adjust if necessary. Resident's sense of touch may be different than yours. Therefore, resident is best able to identify a comfortable water temperature. 9. Put on gloves. Prevents you from coming into contact with body fluids. 10. Ask the resident to flex her knees and raise her buttocks off the bed by pushing against the mattress with her feet. Place a clean bed protector under her perineal area, including her buttocks. Keeps linen from getting wet. 11. Expose only the area necessary to clean the catheter. Avoid overexposing the resident. Promotes resident privacy. 12. Place a towel under the catheter tubing before washing. Helps keep linen from getting wet. 13. Wet a washcloth in the basin. Apply soap to the washcloth. Clean the area around the meatus. Use a clean area of the washcloth for each stroke. 14. Hold the catheter near the meatus. Avoid tugging the catheter. 15. Clean at least four inches of catheter nearest meatus. Move in only one direction away from the meatus. Use a clean area of the washcloth for each stroke. Prevents infection. 16. Dip a clean washcloth in the water. Rinse area around the meatus using a clean area of the washcloth for each stroke. With a clean, dry towel, dry the area around the meatus. 17. Dip a clean washcloth in the water. Rinse at least four inches of the catheter nearest the meatus. Move in only one direction, away from the meatus. Use a clean area of the washcloth for each stroke. Figure 7-36. Caption. Hold the catheter near the meatus to avoid tugging the catheter. Moving in only one direction, away from the meatus, helps prevent infection. Use a clean area of the washcloth for each stroke. 18. With a clean, dry towel, dry at least four inches of catheter nearest the meatus. Move in only one direction, away from the meatus. Do not tug the catheter. 19. Remove bed protector from under resident and discard. Remove towel from under the catheter tubing and place in proper container. Replace top covers. Remove bath blanket and place in proper container. 20. Place used washcloths in proper container. 21. Empty the basin into the toilet and flush the toilet. Place basin in proper area for cleaning or clean and store it according to facility policy. 22. Remove and discard gloves. 
23. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 24. Return bed to lowest position. Lowering the bed provides for safety. 25. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 26. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 27. Document procedure using facility guidelines. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. Procedure. Emptying the catheter drainage bag. Equipment needed. Graduate. Measuring container. Alcohol wipes. Paper towels. Gloves. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Put on gloves. 6. Place a paper towel on the floor under the drainage bag. Place the graduate on the paper towel. 7. Open the clamp on the bag so that the urine flows out of the bag and into the graduate. Do not let the spout or clamp touch the graduate. Figure 7-37. Caption. Keep the spout and clamp from touching the graduate while draining urine. 8. When the urine has drained from the bag, close the clamp. Using alcohol wipes, clean the drain spout. Place the drain spout back in its holder on the bag. 9. Go into the bathroom. Place graduate on a flat surface and measure at eye level. Note the amount and characteristics of urine. Empty into the toilet and flush the toilet. 10. Clean and store graduate. Discard paper towels. 11. Remove and discard gloves. 12. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 13. Document procedure using facility guidelines. Note amount and characteristics of urine. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. Oxygen therapy is the administration of oxygen to increase the supply of oxygen to the lungs. This increases oxygen to the body tissues. Oxygen therapy is used to treat breathing problems. It is prescribed by a doctor. Nursing assistants never stop, adjust, or administer oxygen. Oxygen may be piped into a resident's room through a central system. It may be in tanks or produced by an oxygen concentrator. An oxygen concentrator is a box-like device that changes air in the room into air with more oxygen. Some residents receive oxygen through a nasal cannula. A nasal cannula is a piece of plastic tubing that fits around the face and is secured by a strap that goes over the ears and around the back of the head. The face piece has two short prongs made of tubing. These prongs fit inside the nose and oxygen is delivered through them. A nurse or respiratory therapist fits the cannula. The resident can talk and eat while wearing the cannula. Figure 7-38. Caption. This man is using a nasal cannula. Residents who do not need concentrated oxygen all the time may use a face mask when they need oxygen. The face mask fits over the nose and mouth. It is secured by a strap that goes over the ears and around the back of the head. Plastic tubing connects the mask to the oxygen source. It is difficult for a resident to talk while wearing a face mask. It must be removed for the resident to eat or drink anything. Figure 7-39. Caption. Residents who need oxygen only occasionally may use a face mask. Combustion means the process of burning. Oxygen is a very dangerous fire hazard because it supports combustion, makes other things burn. Working around oxygen requires special safety precautions. Guidelines. Working safely around oxygen. Post no smoking and oxygen in use signs. Never allow smoking where oxygen is used or stored. Remove all fire hazards from the room or area. Fire hazards include electrical equipment such as electric razors and hair dryers. Other fire hazards are cigarettes, matches, and flammable liquids. Flammable means easily ignited and capable of burning quickly. Alcohol and nail polish remover are examples of flammable liquids. Notify the nurse if a resident does not want a fire hazard removed. Do not burn candles, light matches, or use lighters around oxygen. Any type of open flame that is present around oxygen is a dangerous fire hazard. Do not use an extension cord with an oxygen concentrator. Do not place electrical cords or oxygen tubing under rugs or furniture. Avoid using fabrics such as nylon and wool that can cause static electricity discharges. Report if the nasal cannula or face mask causes skin irritation. Check the nasal area and behind the ears for signs of irritation. Do not use any petroleum-based products such as Vaseline or chapstick on the resident or on any part of the cannula or mask. 
Oil-based lubricants can be a fire hazard. Learn how to turn off oxygen in case of fire. Never adjust the oxygen setting or dose. Intravenous therapy, often called IV therapy, is the delivery of medication, nutrition, or fluids through a vein. When a doctor prescribes IV therapy, a nurse inserts a needle or tube into a vein. This gives direct access to the bloodstream. Medication, nutrition, or fluids either drip from a bag suspended on a pole or are pumped by a portable pump through a tube and into the vein. Some residents with chronic conditions may have a permanent opening for IV lines, called a port. It has been surgically created to allow easy access for IV fluids. Nursing assistants never insert or remove IV lines. They are not responsible for care of the IV site. Their only responsibility for IV care is to report and document any observations of changes or problems with the IV line. Observing and reporting IV therapy. Report any of the following to the nurse. The tube needle falls out or is removed. The tubing disconnects. The dressing around the IV site is loose or not intact. Blood is in the tubing or around the IV site. The site is swollen or discolored. The bag is broken or the level of fluid does not seem to decrease. The IV fluid is not dripping or is leaking. The IV fluid is nearly gone. The pump beeps, indicating a problem. The pump is dropped. The resident complains of pain or has trouble breathing. The NA should document her observations and the care given. The NA should not do any of the following. Measure blood pressure on an arm with an IV line. Get the IV site wet. Pull or catch the tubing on anything such as clothing. Special gowns with sleeves that snap and unsnap are available to lessen the risk of pulling out IV lines. Leave the tubing kinked. Lower the IV bag below the IV site. Touch the clamp. Disconnect the IV from the pump or turn off the alarm. Learning Objective 7. Discuss a resident's unit and related care. A resident's unit is the room or area where the resident lives. It contains furniture and personal items. The unit is the resident's home. It must be treated with respect. NAs must always knock and wait for permission before entering. Resident's units must be kept neat and clean. Providing a clean, safe, and orderly environment is an essential part of the NA's job. Standard equipment often found in each resident's unit include the following. Electric or manual bed. Bedside stand. Urinal, bedpan, and covers. Wash basin. Emesis basin. Soap dish and soap. Bath blanket. Toilet paper. Personal hygiene items. Overbed table. Chair. Call light. Privacy curtain or screen. Small items are usually stored in bedside stands. The water pitcher and cup are often placed on top of the bedside stand. A telephone, radio, and other items such as photos may also be placed there. The overbed table may be used for meals or personal care. It is a clean area. It must be kept clean and free of clutter. Bedpans, urinals, soiled linen, and other contaminated items should not be placed on overbed tables. The intercom system is the most common call system. When the resident presses the button, a light will be seen and or a bell will be heard at the nurse's station. The call light allows the resident to contact staff when necessary. NAs must always place the call light within the resident's reach and answer all call lights immediately. Residence Rights Box 7-5, Privacy Curtains. All residents in a facility have the legal right to personal privacy. This means that they must always be protected from public view when receiving care. Each bed usually has a privacy curtain that extends all the way around the bed. Curtains keep others from seeing a resident undressed or while having care procedures done. To protect the resident's privacy, NAs must keep this curtain closed when giving care. Although curtains and screens block vision, they do not block sound. NAs should keep their voices low. They should not discuss a resident's care near others. Closing the door, when possible, gives more complete privacy. Figure 7-40, Caption. Nursing assistants should pull the privacy curtain around the bed before giving care. There are many types of equipment in a care facility. NAs must know how to use and care for all equipment properly. This helps prevent infection and injury. An NA should ask for help when needed. She should not try to use equipment that she does not know how to use. Guidelines, residence unit. Clean the overbed table after use. Place it within the resident's reach before leaving. Keep the call light within the resident's reach. Check to see that it is within reach of the resident's stronger, unaffected hand before you leave the room. Keep equipment clean and in good condition. If any equipment appears damaged, report it to the nurse and or file the proper paperwork to get it repaired. Do not use broken or damaged equipment. OBRA requires that long-term care facilities have comfortable and safe environments by maintaining a temperature range of 71 to 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Older people may feel cold often. 
Lay your clothing and bed covers for warmth. Keep residents away from drafty areas. If residents control the heat and air conditioning in their rooms, do not change it for your comfort. Remove meal trays right after meals. Check to make sure that there are no crumbs in the bed. Straighten bed linens as needed. Change linens if they become wet, soiled, or wrinkled. Restock supplies. Make sure the resident has fresh drinking water and a clean cup within reach. Check that the resident is able to lift the pitcher in the cup. Make sure that tissues, paper towels, toilet paper, soap, and other supplies that are used daily are stocked before you leave. If trash needs to be emptied or the bathroom needs to be cleaned, notify the housekeeping department. Trash should be emptied at least daily. Remove the trash when you leave the room if housekeeping staff is not available. Report signs of insects or pests right away. Do not move a resident's belongings. Do not discard any personal items. Respect the resident's things. Clean equipment and return it to storage or take it to the proper area for cleaning. Tidy the area. Learning Objective 8. Explain the importance of sleep and perform proper bed making. Sleep is a natural period of rest for the mind and body. As a person sleeps, the mind and the body's energy is restored. During sleep, vital functions are performed. These include repairing and renewing cells, processing information, and organizing memory. Sleep is essential to a person's health and well-being. A lack of sleep causes many problems. These include decreased mental function, reduced reaction time, and irritability. Sleep deprivation also decreases immune system function. Many elderly persons, especially those who are living away from their homes, have sleep problems. Many things can affect sleep, such as fear, anxiety, stress, noise, diet, medications, and illness. Sharing a room with another person can disturb sleep. Observing and reporting sleep issues. When a resident complains that he or she is not sleeping well, observe and report the following. Sleeping too much during the day. Eating or drinking items that contain caffeine late in the day. Wearing night clothes during the day. Eating heavy meals late at night. Refusing to take medication ordered for sleep. Taking new medications. Having the TV, radio, computer, phone, or light on late at night. Having pain. Some residents spend much or all of their time in bed. Careful bed making is essential for comfort, cleanliness, and health. Linen should always be changed after personal care such as bed baths. They should also be changed any time bedding or sheets are damp, soiled, or in need of straightening. Bed linen should be changed often for these reasons. Sheets that are damp, wrinkled, or bunched up are uncomfortable. They may keep the resident from sleeping well. Microorganisms thrive in moist, warm places. Bedding that is damp or unclean may cause infection and disease. Residents who spend long hours in bed are at risk for pressure injuries. Sheets that do not lie flat increase this risk by cutting off circulation. Guidelines Bed making. Keep linens wrinkle-free and tidy. Change linen whenever wet, damp, wrinkled, or dirty. Wash your hands before handling clean linen. Figure 7-41. Caption. Make sure you have washed your hands before gathering clean linen. Place clean linen on a clean surface within reach, such as a bedside stand, overbed table, or chair. Do not place clean linen on the floor or on a contaminated area. Don, put on, gloves before removing bed linen from the bed. Look for personal items such as dentures, hearing aids, jewelry, and glasses before removing linen. When removing linen, fold or roll linen so that the dirtiest area is inside. Rolling puts the dirtiest surface of the linen inward. This lessens contamination. Do not shake linen or clothes. It may spread airborne contaminants. Bag soiled linen at the point of origin. Do not take it to other residents' rooms. Sort soiled linen away from resident care areas. Place wet linen in leak-proof bags. Wear gloves when handling soiled linen. Hold soiled linen away from your body. Place it in the proper container or area immediately. If dirty linen touches your uniform, your uniform becomes contaminated. Change disposable bed protectors whenever they become soiled or wet. Discard them in the proper container. Put a clean bed protector on the bed when you change linen. If a resident cannot get out of bed, an NA must change the linens with the resident in bed. An occupied bed is a bed made while the resident is still in the bed. When making the bed, the NA should use a wide stance and bend her knees. Bending from the waist should be avoided, especially when tucking sheets under the mattress. The height of the bed should be raised to make the job easier and safer. Procedure. Making an occupied bed. Equipment needed. Clean linen. Mattress pad. Fitted or flat bottom sheet. Disposable bed protector if needed. Cotton draw sheet. Flat top sheet. Blankets. Bedspread if used, bath blanket, 
Pillowcases. Gloves. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 2. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 3. Explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. 4. Provide for resident privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. 5. Place clean linen on clean surface within reach. For example, bedside stand, overbed table, or chair. Prevents contamination of linen. 6. Adjust bed to a safe level, usually waist high. Lower the head of the bed. Lock bed wheels. When bed is flat, resident can be moved without working against gravity. Adjusting bed level and locking wheels prevents injury to you and resident. 7. Put on gloves. Prevents you from coming into contact with body fluids. 8. Loosen top linen from the end of the bed on the working side. 9. Unfold the bath blanket over the top sheet to cover the resident. Remove the top sheet. Keep the resident covered at all times with the bath blanket. 10. You will make the bed one side at a time. Raise the far side rail if used, then go to the other side of the bed. Help the resident to turn onto her side toward the raised side rail. 11. Loosen the bottom soiled linen, mattress pad, and protector if present on the working side. 12. Roll the bottom soiled linen toward the resident, soiled side inside. Tuck it snugly against the resident's back. Rolling puts dirtiest surface of linen inward, lessening contamination. The closer the linen is rolled to resident, the easier it is to remove from the other side. 13. Place the mattress pad, if used, on the bed, attaching elastic at corners on the working side. 14. Place and tuck in the clean bottom linen. Make hospital corners to keep the bottom sheet wrinkle-free. Finish with the bottom sheet free of wrinkles. Hospital corners prevent a resident's feet from being restricted by or tangled in linen when getting in and out of bed. Figure 7-42. Caption. Hospital corners help keep the flat sheet smooth under the resident. 15. Smooth the bottom sheet out toward the resident. Be sure there are no wrinkles in the mattress pad. Roll the extra material toward the resident. Tuck it under the resident's body. Figure 7-43. Caption. Tuck extra material under the resident's body. 16. If using a disposable bed protector, unfold it and center it on the bed. Tuck the side near you under the mattress. Smooth it out toward the resident. Tuck as you did with the sheet. 17. If using a draw sheet, place it on the bed. Tuck in on your side, smooth, and tuck as you did with the other bedding. 18. Raise the side rail if used nearest you. Go to the other side of the bed and lower that side rail. Help the resident roll or turn onto clean bottom sheet toward you. Protect the resident from any soiled matter on the old linens. 19. Loosen the soiled linen. Check for any personal items. Roll the linen from the head to the foot of the bed. Avoid contact with your skin or clothes. Place it in a hamper or bag. Do not put it on the floor or furniture. Do not shake it. Soiled linens are full of microorganisms that should not be spread to other parts of the room. Always work from cleanest, head of bed, to dirtiest, foot of bed, area to prevent spread of infection. Rolling puts dirtiest surface of linen inward, lessening contamination. 20. Pull the clean linen through as quickly as possible. Start with the mattress pad and wrap around the corners. Pull and tuck in the clean bottom linen just like the other side. Pull and tuck in the bed protector and draw sheet if used. Make hospital corners with the bottom sheet. Finish with bottom sheet free of wrinkles. 21. Ask the resident to turn onto her back. Help as needed. Keep the resident covered and comfortable with a pillow under her head. Raise the side rail. 22. Unfold the top sheet. Place it over the resident and center it. Ask the resident to hold the top sheet. Slip the bath blanket out from underneath. Put it in the hamper or bag. Figure 7-44, caption. With the resident holding onto the top sheet, pull the bath blanket out. 23. Place a blanket over the top sheet. Match the top edges. Place the bedspread over the blanket if used, matching the top edges. Tuck the bottom edges of the top sheet, blanket, and bedspread under the foot of the bed. Make hospital corners on each side. Loosen the top linens over the resident's feet. At the top of the bed, fold the top sheet over the blanket about 6 inches. Loosening the top linens over the feet prevents pressure on the feet, which can cause pressure injuries. 24. Remove the pillow. Do not hold it near your face. Remove the soiled pillowcase by turning it inside out. 
Place it in the hamper or bag. 25. Remove and discard gloves. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 26. With one hand, grasp the clean pillowcase at the closed end. Turn it inside out over your arm. Next, using the same hand that has the pillowcase over it, grasp the center of the end of the pillow. Pull the pillowcase over it with your free hand. Do the same for any other pillows. Place them under resident's head with open end away from door. Figure 7-45, caption. After the pillowcase is turned inside out over your arm, grasp one end of the pillow. Pull the pillowcase over the pillow. 27. Make resident comfortable. 28. Return bed to lowest position. Leave side rails in the ordered position. Lowering the bed provides for safety. 29. Place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 30. Take laundry bag or hamper to proper area. 31. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 32. Report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 33. Document procedure using facility guidelines. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. Mattresses can be heavy. It is easier to make an empty bed than one with a resident in it. An unoccupied bed is a bed made while no resident is in the bed. If the resident can be moved, the NA's job will be easier. Procedure. Making an unoccupied bed. Equipment needed. Clean linen. Mattress pad. Fitted or flat bottom sheet. Disposable bed protector if needed. Blankets. Cotton draw sheet. Flat top sheet. Bedspread if used. Pillowcases. Gloves. 1. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. 2. Place clean linen on clean surface within reach. For example, bedside stand, overbed table, or chair. Prevents contamination of linen. 3. Adjust bed to a safe level, usually waist high. Put bed in flattest position. Lock bed wheels. Allows you to make a neat, wrinkle-free bed. 4. Put on gloves. Prevents you from coming into contact with body fluids. 5. Loosen soiled linen. Roll soiled linen, soiled side inside, from the head to the foot of the bed. Avoid contact with your skin or clothes. Place it in a hamper or bag. Do not put it on the floor or furniture. Do not shake it. Remove pillows and pillowcases and place pillowcases in hamper or bag. Always work from cleanest, head of bed, to dirtiest, foot of bed, area to prevent spread of infection. Rolling puts dirtiest surface of linen inward, lessening risk of contamination. 6. Remove and discard gloves. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 7. Remake the bed. Start with the mattress pad and wrap around corners. Place and tuck in the clean bottom linen. Make hospital corners to keep the bottom sheet wrinkle-free. Put on the disposable bed protector and draw sheet if used. Smooth and tuck under sides of the bed. 8. Place top sheet, blanket, and bedspread if used over bed. Center these, tuck under the end of the bed, and make hospital corners. Fold down the top sheet over the blanket about 6 inches. Fold both the top sheet and blanket down so the resident can easily get into bed. If the resident will not be returning to bed immediately, leave bedding up. 9. Put on clean pillowcases. Replace pillows. 10. Return bed to lowest position. 11. Take laundry bag or hamper to proper area. 12. Wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 13. Document procedure using facility guidelines. If you do not document the care, legally, it did not happen. A closed bed is a bed completely made with the bedspread and blankets in place. It is made for residents who will be out of bed most of the day. It is also made when a resident is discharged. A closed bed is turned into an open bed by folding the linen down to the foot of the bed. An open bed is a bed that is ready to receive a resident who has been out of bed all day or who is being admitted to the facility. Learning Objective 9. Discuss dressings and bandages. Sterile dressings cover new, open, or draining wounds. A nurse changes these dressings. Non-sterile dressings are applied to dry, closed wounds that have less chance of infection. Nursing assistants may change non-sterile dressings. State regulations vary, so NA should follow state and facility policies. Procedure. Changing a dry dressing using non-sterile technique. Equipment needed. Package of square gauze dressings. Adhesive tape. Scissors. Two pairs of gloves. Plastic bag. 1. Identify yourself by name. Identify the resident by name. Resident has right to know identity of his or her caregiver. Addressing resident by name shows respect and establishes correct identification. 
Two, wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. Three, explain procedure to resident. Speak clearly, slowly, and directly. Maintain face-to-face -face contact whenever possible. Promotes understanding and independence. Four, provide for resident's privacy with curtain, screen, or door. Maintains resident's right to privacy and dignity. Five, cut pieces of tape long enough to secure the dressing. Hang tape on the edge of a table within reach. Open the four inch gauze square package without touching the gauze. Place the opened package on a flat surface. Six, put on gloves. Protects you from coming into contact with body fluids. Seven, remove soiled dressing by gently peeling the tape toward the wound. Lift the dressing off the wound. Do not drag it over the wound. Observe dressing for any odor or drainage. Notice the color and size of the wound. Discard used dressing in plastic bag. Avoids disturbing wound healing. Reduces risk of contamination. Eight, remove and discard gloves in plastic bag. Wash your hands. Provide for infection prevention. Nine, put on clean gloves. Touching only the outer edges of the new gauze, remove it from package. Apply it to the wound. Tape gauze in place. Secure it firmly. Keeps gauze as clean as possible. Figure 7-46, caption. Tape gauze in place to secure the dressing. Do not completely cover all areas of the dressing with tape. 10, discard supplies in proper container. 11, remove and discard gloves. 12, wash your hands. Provides for infection prevention. 13, place call light within resident's reach. Allows resident to communicate with staff as necessary. 14, report any changes in resident to the nurse. Provides nurse with information to assess resident. 15, document procedure according to facility guidelines. If you do not document the care, legally it did not happen. Elastic bandages, also called non-sterile bandages, ACE bandages or ACE wraps, are used to hold dressings in place, secure splints, and support and protect body parts. In addition, these bandages may decrease swelling that occurs from injury. Figure 7-47, caption, this is one type of elastic bandage. NAs may be required to help with elastic bandages. Duties may include the following. Bringing the bandage to the resident. Positioning the resident to apply the bandage. Washing and storing the bandage. Documenting observations about the bandage. Some states allow NAs to apply and remove elastic bandages. They should follow their facilities policies and the care plan regarding elastic bandages. Guidelines, elastic bandages. Keep the area to be wrapped clean and dry. Apply bandage snugly enough to control bleeding and prevent movement of dressings. Make sure that the body part is not wrapped too tightly, which can decrease circulation. Wrap the bandage evenly in a figure eight pattern so that no part of the wrapped area is pinched. Do not tie the bandage because this cuts off circulation to the body part. The end is held in place with special clips or tape. Remove the bandage as often as indicated in the care plan. Check the bandage often. It can become wrinkled or loose, which causes it to lose effectiveness. It can also become bunched up, which causes pressure and possible discomfort. Check on the resident 10 to 15 minutes after the bandage is applied to check for signs of poor circulation. Signs and symptoms of poor circulation include the following. Swelling, pale, gray, cyanotic, bluish, or white skin. Shiny, tight skin. Skin that is cold to the touch. Sores. Numbness. Tingling. Pain or discomfort. Loosen the bandage if you note any signs of poor circulation and notify the nurse immediately.